from Microbe TV, this is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 80, recorded on July 29th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels Eldi. Hey there, Vincent. Hi from uh, LD Lab Studios. Uh rugged science outpost in the Western Rocky Mountains. <laughs> a rugged outpost. Huh? I don't know. I'm just playing around with my intros uh, these days, I guess. But um, but um, speaking of outposts, we've been hanging out recently in vivo. So the um, American Society for Virology meeting just happened That's right. um, last week in Madison, Wisconsin. So we were able to be together um, among other virologists, masked virologists by and large <laughs> and um you know today we, we uh a, a great outcome from that meeting was seeing some really exciting up and coming work um from all over the place with a big focus on evolution um i think i mean it's the uh, it's virology across the board but um some lots of evolution on hand and we'll be focusing on that today and even better we have a guest because of the asv meeting yeah so both, both Nels and I went to a there's there's a satellite meeting which is just the day before ASV starts multiple satellites which is a really good tradition yeah. uh, and one uh, I don't remember the title it was about evolution and genomics and I went to that one and I heard our guest uh, to, who who uh, is here with us today and I said to to Nels we have to get her on uh, Twivo and so. Happy to introduce from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, Louise Monclo. Welcome, Louise. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here from Seattle in my apartment. <laughs> yeah, good, <laughs> good morning, Louise. Great to have you here. <laughs> so we've got uh, at least three time zones covered, uh, Pacific, Mountain, and Eastern there at the incubator. Um, who else is, uh, we should go around the horn here a little bit, Vincent. Who else is with us on our live stream? Yeah, folks, I know that uh, Andrew is here from New Zealand. Fantastic. Well, tell us, uh, I know Tom, our moderator, is from Oregon. He's, uh, mm -hmm. he's in Portland, I believe. But uh, we met Tom at uh, ASV. I don't know if you saw him, Nels. Oh, I missed uh, I missed you there, Tom. I apologize, but thanks. Yeah, for... he came. He came and and registered as a civilian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tom actually has a PhD, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, he uh, is nominally, you know, in a lab at uh, at Oregon. But um, he he was he was just terrific. Who else is here? Let's see. Barb Mack is from the UK. Um, Colorado. Gary's from Colorado. Uh, Eastern Outpost of the Rockies. Uh, so I just got back from Colorado. I was in Fort Collins for a bat meeting, which I'll tell you more about <laughs> later. It was so awesome. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Um, and who else we have? Well, we have uh, 40 people now. And um, Ellie well, is from uh, San Francisco. That's pretty cool. Yeah, welcome, uh, everyone. Welcome, everybody. And uh, you've got, you have some cool MKs from uh, Eastern drought-stricken Eastern Massachusetts. Here we go. Let's mm. let's mm. highlight uh, that one. Drought-stricken. I'm sorry about the drought. It was pretty pretty brown in Colorado. Elizabeth is from West Virginia. Claire is from the UK. Uh, Dashen gal is from Delaware. I guess you like Dashens, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, I just love the international. Aspect of Philip is from Wales, UK. Hello, Philip. Um, and of course, a lot of people are sleeping, so they can't be with us. Although we've had people from <laughs> countries at 3 a.m. Oh, yeah. Tom is in Western Oregon Central Coast Range, west of Eugene. Okay. Oh, here we go. Vina's from India. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Maureen is from. I got a little bit of a delay here between the actual stream and what I'm seeing. Maureen no, is from good. Sacramento. There you go. Where I bet it's really hot. So welcome, everyone. You got some cool science for you today. You're going to really like this. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, and so that, um, you know, that satellite session you were mentioning, Vincent, this was, uh, I think it was called Shaking the Trees. Uh, the that's right. <laughs> trees in this case. Um, organized by Adam Loring. He's at the University of Michigan great um, science colleague 
and um, fellow evolutionary enthusiast. Uh, and so, yeah, I was in the room that morning too, or yeah, I think it was last Saturday morning. And um, also was really inspired by Luis's talk and work. And so it's really fun, Luis, to have you here. Maybe before we get into some of the details of what you were talking about and some of the um, things you're up to, maybe can we step back and just hear a little bit about sort of your background, where you're from and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I went to undergrad at Penn State, so Central PA. Uh, there, I double majored in biology and trumpet performance. So <laughs> I spent, <laughs> spent actually a good portion of my college um, hoping to be a trumpet player professionally and then thinking about doing music history for a while. <laughs> um, and then actually in my junior year, I took a class taught by Eddie Holmes back when he was still at Penn State about the evolution of infectious diseases. And I just loved it. I just thought yeah. it was so crazy that viruses have these high mutation rates and can evolve so rapidly. And so, yeah, I asked him, I was like, how do I work on this? And he kind of was like, yeah, you should apply to grad school and go get a PhD. And, you know, these are some people doing interesting work. So I did that. I went to get my PhD in Tom Friedrich's lab at the University of Wisconsin. So going back to ASB was pretty fun because, you know, got to see some old mm. friends from Wisconsin and be back where I got my PhD. Um, and then. Yeah, that's uh, right. And that's where that's where I ran into you, Luis, was at um, Andy Maley uh, through a cocktail hour over at his house. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Was he on your thesis committee by any chance? He or? was. Okay, yes, yeah. he was he was like the main molecular virologist on my thesis committee. He was a great committee member. <laughs> so I believe it. Uh, yeah. So Louise, when we did a TWIV some time ago with and, and Tom was on it. Uh in a couple I don't know if you were there at that time. Do you remember? I was. I was a student actually when you did that. So oh, cool. I do remember that. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. So I did my PhD with him and then moved out to Seattle in twenty seventeen to do a postdoc with Trevor. Trevor Bedford. Um, that's been great. Yeah. And maybe let's talk a little bit about that transition. So was it like clear to you that you were going to go to Trevor's lab or how did, how did that process unfold? Did you consider several labs? I did consider several labs. Yeah. Huh. I had this um, thought that at the end of my PhD, I was really good at generating sequence data and I'd done my whole PhD looking at within host diversity of RNA viruses. And I felt that there were two directions I could go to learn new skills. Um, I considered kind of going down the basic virology path and learning how to really grow viruses and manipulate them in the lab. Or I thought I could just go more computational and learn about phylogenetic trees and all the questions you can answer with phylogenetics. And so, um, and I interviewed with Trevor's lab and the lab was just fantastic. And I thought Seattle would be a fun place to live. And these were some really exciting questions I could learn to answer. So yeah, it was absolutely the right choice. And yeah, it's been really great. fun. And boy, were you in the right place at the right time? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> in hindsight, it was a really, it was a really great decision. <laughs> but this was, this is so um, kind of the obvious explosion of coronavirus, uh, interest in coronavirus diversity and gen genomic epidemiology. This still was still not really on the radar because did you say this was 2017 or what, when was when did you start your postdoc? Yeah, 2017 was when I okay. started. So I think genomic epi was right at the beginning of kind of becoming a thing. So people were just starting to use these tools that had been originally developed for studying viral evolution and applying them to these epidemiologic questions. So there were a couple papers out looking at the Ebola outbreak um, and you know maybe, and then a couple years later, there was one describing Zika in the Americas, but genomic epi hadn't really become mainstream yet. And, it's and really actually, uh, unfortunate because uh, there's so many outbreaks. We'd love to have that kind of information. I was talking at the bat meeting. I did a twiz there with uh, hmm. with Raina Plowright and Vincent Munster, hmm. and I said, "Okay, so what happened during the NEPA outbreak?" And they said, "We don't know. There's hardly any sequence data." <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I mean, and I think there's a lot of barriers to generating sequence data. Um, you know, it takes a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of planning, and you have to really believe that the data is going to be worth it. And yeah. so I think that, you know, one of the one of the silver linings of the pandemic is really that we've seen the utility of these techniques and these tools to answer these important questions. 
So, and then obviously, so you've picked up SARS-2 um, as part of your research focus, but um, I'm guessing that's what happened po sort of post-pandemic as that was unfolding. But so what was your main focus when you arrived in Trevor Bedford's lab at the Hutch? Yeah, my main focus, I always wanted to work on avian flu. Part of my mm -hmm. PhD was about host adaptation of influenza viruses, and I wanted to keep working on that. So I still work on avian influenza a little bit. Um, I also did a project on mumps, which turned out to be really fun. And I didn't talk about this at ASV, but there was an yeah. outbreak in 2016 that we characterized, and that was also a pretty fun project. So broadly respiratory viruses. Yeah. And having that, um, and I get that engine of um, sort of genomic surveillance is already in place, certainly for f influenza, as, and we'll dig into some of your work there in a minute. Um, but sort of, I guess having that framework seems like it's pretty useful for um, many outbreaks, you can sort of take the specific genome, genome or genome variation of the various outbreaks around the world and then put that into the same framework. Is that true or is, are the viruses different enough genomically that that's easier said than done? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say in general that works and you, you can always kind of try it to, to see mm -hmm. how well it works. I think the main difference is just um, you know, based on kind of this combination of the substitution rate and then the serial interval at which, you know, the you know length of time between new infections. And so you want a high enough mutation rate that you're accumulating mutations that are um, so that as you transmit along a transmission chain, you know, genomes are different in people that you sample. Um, and so if your substitution rate is too low um, or your serial interval is just like too fast, then you end up with a bunch of identical genomes and that really reduces your resolution. Um, so there's a little bit of a balancing act in terms of the diversity, but a lot of RNA viruses have tons of diversity. So this works pretty well. Yeah, for sure. I think this is, that this will be a challenge, um, perhaps in the <laughs> weeks, months, years ahead with monkeypox, uh, DNA virus, the large genome, I'm guessing mm -hmm. that, um, you know, yeah, just as you're saying, Luis, um, some of the challenges of, of, um, seeing enough diversity um, in point mutations and then maybe even considering some of the other mechanisms of um, of adaptation or variation that happen, um, mechanisms of mutation that happen among pox viruses will be a, a challenge ahead. It'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. Yeah, we have, absolutely. We have, a, we have somebody from Seattle, uh, Louise. Oh, yes, it is lost, a heat wave. <laughs> lost laboratory, we have Sarah from Scotland. And we have Markle from Eastern Long Island. So, Louise, you're you're currently still in the in the Bedford lab, right? I am currently in the Bedford lab. Yeah, but are only you... for like a few more days. <laughs> a few more days. Where are you going? <laughs> yeah, so I'll be starting my own lab at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and my start date is September first. So we are moving in about a week. Wow. You're not going to be yeah. far yeah. from New York. <laughs> no, we'll be very close. Very good. <laughs> Just a quick train. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Wow, that's really exciting. Um, so, and um, maybe some details on that. So, you're, what, what department are you going to be? Where is, will your lab be in at Penn? Yeah, I'll be in the Department of Pathobiology, which mm -hmm. is sort of like the basic science microbiology department, but nested within the vet school. Great. Yeah, really fantastic. Incredible. Yeah group of creative new colleagues and um, with you, I think, coming in with all kinds of fresh energy um, in, in your research program, that seems like um, if anyone's in the market for um, a, a lab to do research in, the big recommendation to check out the Moncla lab for sure. Yes, absolutely. We'll be hiring, so <laughs> <Get me email. laughs> on every at talk it, at, at ASV now, so that's what every people were saying. Well, I'm looking for postdocs. I'm yeah, looking that's for right. Postdocs. Exactly. Yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> it's actually a great time to to be a postdoc. There are it's a um, you know buyer's market, so to speak, for all kinds of great labs where there are all kinds of opportunities and stuff. So, yeah, um, I think this is a good time to um, think about academics, as everyone is sort of um, wondering if there's other things going on, just opening up some really great opportunities. So um, Luis, will you at least take a break before I like, catch your breath a little bit between the end of your postdoc and the beginning of grand opening of the Moncla lab? Yeah, um, so I'm basically taking like all of next week off. Um, and I, I've been pretty, ever since I got back from ASB, I've been working sort of like part time just to take care of odds and ends. But yeah, we've, we've gotten the chance to like 
you know, do some hiking trips and do some camping and enjoying the beautiful Pacific Northwest before we leave. Um, we also took a nice vacation in June. We went to Hawaii for 10 days. So we've, we've definitely taken some, some breaks. Nice. Cool Good idea. Uh, Great idea. Yeah. We're hoping to uh, cover the two topics uh, you talked about at ASV today, both H5N1, influenza virus, and SARS-CoV-2. We'll see how we do on that. I was wondering if we could start with the H5N1 story since, um, you know, it's pretty in people's minds right now. In fact, uh, Lost Laboratory says, what's happening? The Woodland Park Zoo has most of their birds in quarantine. I guess you know about that, right, uh, Louise? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so avian flu is like this persistent problem, but it hasn't impacted North America. So um, the deal with avian flu, so all influenza viruses naturally circulate in wild aquatic birds. So wild birds are the natural reservoir for all influenza viruses. The, there's a huge outbreak going on right now among wild birds and domestic birds in uh, North America, as well as Europe. And that is of a subtype called H5N1, which um, tends to be highly pathogenic. And so this virus first started causing outbreaks in 1996. Back in 1996, there was a domestic goose in China that was found with this virus, and it caused a series of outbreaks that infected both humans and domestic birds. Since 1996, this virus has been causing recurrent outbreaks in both um, humans and domestic birds as well. Um, these viruses are a huge problem for like everyone involved. So when they infect people, case fatality rates can be really high. So they can be as high as 60%. They're really bad for poultry production and agriculture because they have very high um, case fatality in chickens, especially. And so when these viruses get into domestic bird flocks, often the main response mechanism that we have is to cull or you know kill entire flocks of birds. So this is economically very bad. This is, I think, pretty traumatic for poultry farmers. And it's just generally not a very, it, it sort of works, but it's not the best control strategy. It's also really bad for wild bird health. So there's this interesting thing that happens where these H5 viruses can be transmitted into poultry, um, specifically chickens, and then they tend to acquire this uh, insertion in their receptor binding protein that actually makes them more pathogenic. So in instances in which you have transmission in poultry and selection for this high pathogenic phenotype, you can then get transmission back into wild birds and it can actually cause these huge die-offs. So actually last fall, I believe there was a huge die-off of wild cranes in Israel. It was something mm. like thousands of cranes died. Mm. So, you know, everyone should care about bird flu. It's bad for people, it's bad for agriculture, and it's really bad for wild birds as well. So regardless of which category you care about, <laughs> you should you should care about bird flu. So Louise, how so, would it get from, from Asia to North America, for example? Yeah, so because the natural host species for these viruses are these wild migrating birds. Um, these migrating birds can spread these viruses really long distances during their migratory paths. So um, we know that there are instances in which these wild migrating birds have transferred these viruses across continents. Mm. So um, we think that this is what has happened this year. So there's this huge outbreak that started in Europe of highly pathogenic H5N1. It caused all these outbreaks in wild birds and domestic birds. But, and then eventually we think that one of these migrating birds, you know, transferred these viruses to North America, where we're now seeing all of these outbreaks across the US and Canada. So um, what's happening in the Woodland Park Zoo? Uh, people have been finding dead birds all over the place. So wild mm -hmm. birds, as well as domestic birds. And um, the, the best way to prevent new introductions of these viruses into your local bird populations is to, to quarantine those birds and prevent them from interacting with wild birds. So that is probably the goal because most birds are susceptible to bird flu and it can be um, really devastating to these populations. But you haven't, uh, or no, someone hasn't looked in the zoo to see if there's any H5N1, have they? Not to my knowledge. I don't know yeah. anyone who has done it, so, and I probably would <laughs> if, if someone was doing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe the next postdoc in the Bedford lab could <laughs> step up. To well, well Louise, in the summer of 1999, birds started dying in the Bronx Zoo here in New York. Mm. And that, that turned out to be West Nile, the first introduction of West Nile virus into the U.S. And uh, a, very, a very astute pathologist 
she she um, said this is it's it's hitting certain birds and not others, and and she was the one who began to figure it out. It's a great story. Yeah, <laughs> really good story. <laughs> So you're not at the Woodland Park Zoo, but you are getting sequences from H5N1 flu from various sampling around the world. Maybe tell us a little bit about that, where you get your mm -hmm. data from. Yeah, so I've gotten data from a few different sources in the past. So I have this ongoing collaboration with the Pasteur Institute in Cambodia. So the Pasteur Institute is um, kind of functions as, as the public health lab in Cambodia and H5N1 is endemic in Cambodia. So they've been doing surveillance there on their bird populations for a really long time. So the Pasteur Institute is one of many World Health Organization collaborating centers. So the way that we do avian flu surveillance is that there are these collaborating centers all around the world. These collaborating centers sample birds, um, usually at these live bird markets, but sometimes also wild birds as well. And if they find one of these highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses, they sequence some subset of those samples and then they generally share them publicly on these databases. So for the, a lot of the analyses I'm doing now, I'm just using publicly available data that's been deposited in GISAID or GenBank. So these are contributed from people all over, over, all over the world doing surveillance. Yeah, that's great. And having those resources, I mean, the more people that are willing to share their data, I mean, we've seen this time and again, um, certainly with SARS-2, just other situations where that can really unlock the uh, possibility of um, analyzing these genomes and understanding what's going on with the variation of these viruses to, to really make some headway into, into transmission, what might be going on, thinking about the evolution here. So yeah. um, you, I know you, uh, so the paper that you published um, on the H5N1 includes some of that data from Cambodia, but maybe actually bring us up to date from your ASV talk. I think you included some of that data, but even some more interesting stuff from your analysis. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, we have one published paper about this, but the rest of the data I showed at ASV is unpublished. So it's very much work in progress. Um, so the published paper that we did was basically, there's this open question of how these H5N1 viruses evolve within infected people. When, so people can be naturally infected, usually by direct interaction with sick birds. And people have really worried that if people keep getting infected, that these viruses could one day evolve to replicate more efficiently in people. And that would be a problem because we really don't want an H5N1 pandemic. And so the study that we did was that the Pasteur Institute in Cambodia had this outbreak among humans in 2013, where they had sampled people as well as domestic birds that got infected with H5N1. And so we just looked at those infections and we asked, how are those viruses evolving within those people? And can we compare that to how these viruses are evolving in these domestic birds? And basically we were able to show that these viruses evolve a little bit in humans. So they acquire some human adapting mutations but that those mutations don't really go to fixation during the course of an individual infection. And so when we looked at all these infections, we have this catalog of mutations that we know are important for H5N1 adaptation. And we know this from laboratory studies or all these, this other great work that people have done to identify mutations that are important for eliciting host switching. So we looked for all those mutations and we found a few of them, but we found that they weren't that common. So, you know, that was, an interesting finding, but it led us to wonder, you know, what else is important for cross-species transmission? What is, what are the factors that determine how these viruses move into people um, and spread efficiently among domestic birds? So the project that we're working on now and that I spent a lot of time uh, talking about at ASB is when we're trying to answer those questions using publicly available consensus genomes. Um, and so basically what we did in that study was uh, we downloaded all of the H5N1 virus sequences that are available publicly. I spent a lot of time doing um, curating those sequences. So if anyone's ever worked with flu data, there's a lot of like spelling errors and like funny stuff in these databases. <laughs> so um, a lot of time was spent kind of curating um, and standardizing host names from mm -hmm. these uh, sequence strain names. Um, and then we figured out, so one of the open questions is how frequently these viruses are moving between wild birds, domestic birds, and humans. And so we figured out that basically if you use the um, host, the host name, and if you do some manual curation, you can kind of categorize bird sequences into whether they came from wild birds or domestic birds. Um, so that's great. So we had this nice data set and then we worked on trying to figure out how to appropriately model this. 
Um, and one thing we did that ended up working really well was we applied this, this new type of model that, that's really exciting to us, but a little bit in the weeds. So I'll just say that it overcomes some previously some previous challenges to phylogenetics. So there's these really nice phylogenetic models, but they don't perform well when sampling is uneven across groups. So when they're sampling bias, they fail. So we used this new type of model that performs much better in the presence of sampling bias. And this is really important for avian flu because sampling is not necessarily even across time or across host groups. So by starting with that model and making some modifications, um, we've ended up with, I think, a pretty reasonable phylogenetic tree that we can now use to start to look at these questions. And so our preliminary data um, is showing us that cross-species transmission between wild birds and domestic birds is happening a lot. So this is happening like four to eight times a year since their initial, across uh, 23 years of data that, that we accumulated we do see some evidence for a transmission from domestic birds back into wild birds. Uh -huh. um, and the reason that this matters is that this tells us that controlling bird flu is going to depend not only on controlling endemically circulating strains, but also reducing new introductions in both directions. Uh -huh. um, the other pieces of data I showed was that there was also this really interesting open question of why only some of these viruses successfully infect people. So there are a lot of different clades of H5N1, but only some of them ever infect people. And there's this interesting observation that I found from talking to my collaborators in Cambodia, which is that they will say that there are times that there is tons of H5N1 circulating in their live bird markets and no human infections. And other times, you know, they don't see much bird flu, but then suddenly they detect a bunch of human infections and they don't really know why. And so previous studies that have tried to figure this out, you know, have kind of taken these opportunistic samples and looked for, you know, what mutations are in these uh, viruses that have infected people successfully, but there haven't been controls for, you know, is, you know, for how long these viruses are circulating. And this hasn't been done um, comprehensively in context of all the viruses that have ever infected people. So we are trying to use this data now to look for signatures um, that can account for why these viruses are infected. Some viruses are infecting people and some are not. Um, and so we have some interesting preliminary data that basically the amount of time a virus circulates in domestic birds correlates with an increase in risk for infecting humans, which makes sense. But this is not, um, this depends on which viral clade you're part of. So the genetic backbone likely matters. So what we think is that there are some viral backbones that are inherently slightly better able to infect people. And that for those clades, the longer they circulate, the more people they can infect. While there's other viral clades that just are not able to infect people at all. And so regardless of how long they circulate in domestic birds, they're just never going to infect a person. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. So this, and it, I really like how you're kind of putting together the, almost the local folklore with actually the patterns that you're, you know, the genetic patterns and potentially even sort of see, you know, actually putting some evidence or some science behind the, the stories that you hear um, out at the markets and in related places. Can you give us a sense of the size of the sampling that you're doing here? So the, how many, um, you know, genomes from the wild birds, from the domestic birds, from, from humans? Yeah, so there are like thousands and thousands of bird flu genomes, but most of them mm. come from domestic birds. Mm -hmm. um, so we did a bunch of subsampling to try to even out the distribution among these three different host groups. So in our final data set, um, we had like 300 ish full genomes from humans, about 400 from domestic birds, and about 2,000 from wild birds. And then we subsampled those down, primarily subsampling down the domestic birds. And so we ended up with I think a tree of about 800 total sequences, roughly distributed equally among those three different host groups. Yeah, that sounds like a lot, but I'm guessing when most, um, you know, genomic epidemiologists are hungry for sequences. So um, is that like enough to do the kind of analysis you want to do or would, what would you gain by even having more sequences available? Yeah, I think one thing that I've really learned from really diving into this data is exactly where we could use more, more sequences and more data. And that's, you know, hopefully something we can follow up on the future. You know, we can write grants to try to improve surveillance. 
Um, so there's a real lack of data from, from wild birds and a lot of wild bird sampling is focused in particular geographic regions. So like North America is actually very well sampled for wild birds. Um, there's one woman who is now doing all this great sequencing work in Australia in wild birds. Um, Europe is well sampled for wild birds, um, but we really are lacking data from um, African wild birds as well as Southeast Asian wild birds. And so I think having more data from those different geographic regions would probably be pretty helpful. Um, Louise, you, you yeah. mentioned that there's this correlation between circulation in domestic birds and, and, and infecting people. So why is it the domestic and not the wild bird? Is it simply a matter of more likely to contact people than a wild bird? I think that's the hypothesis, yeah, is that we interact so closely with these domestic birds, particularly when they're at these live bird markets. Um, so at these, you know, live markets or on these commercial farms, you know, you have people just like really in close interaction with these birds. And there's actually data suggesting that when there are H5N1 outbreaks, if you go out and sample at these live bird markets, like if you sample from wash water samples, for example, sometimes like the test positivity rates are incredibly high. So there was one mm -hmm. study from Cambodia where 70% of wash water samples were positive for H5N1. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just like incredible amounts of virus. So we think when there's these outbreaks among these what, domestic birds, there's just a lot of opportunity for human interaction. And, and we, should we should point out that in birds, H5N1 is a gastrointestinal infection, right? Mm -hmm. It's shed in the in the feces or whatever you call it, that birds excrete, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. So um, birds yeah. actually can shed virus from the respiratory tracts as well, um, but it is primarily um, a GI infection. And so it's thought that in the wild bird reservoir, these viruses are transmitted fecal orally. When, yeah, when the they do infect... Term the technical Sorry. term you're looking for is bird poop. Bird poop. Yeah, yeah that's the technical yeah. term. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead, Vincent. No, it's okay. I mean, that's the thing. When birds are flying, they often, just like bats, they yeah. poop while they're flying, and then exactly. they can contaminate things uh, underneath them. Um, so I wanted to ask about when the, the chains of infection among humans are very short, right? What's the, what's the longest that we have been able to trace? Yeah, so I wouldn't even really call them transmission chains. So usually humans are considered, <laughs> they're considered dead end hosts. So usually okay. like one person gets infected and that's the end of the line. Okay. Um, there's a couple of instances in which we think there was human to human transmission among family members taking yeah. care of somebody who was, who was ill. Um, but transmission chains have never gone beyond like maybe one or two immediate family members. So in your data set from Cambodia, the people, none of them acquired infection from someone else. Those were all spillovers from birds, right? Yeah, not that, not that we're aware of. Um, yeah. yeah, they didn't have any linked human cases that were linked to them. So my, you, you found, and you describe in the PLOS paper, PLOS pathogens, some, some signature mutations that lead to amino acid changes that we know are needed, like the receptor binding domain has to change to uh, accommodate alpha-2,6 salic acids. There's a change in the in the polymerase. Andy Mealy's famous uh, amino acid 626, right? Um, and tell me, do they arise in the person or are they present at a minority level in the bird um, and then are amplified in the person? Yeah, this is a question people have been asking for a long time. And I would say that we have a better idea now, but we still don't fully know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what our data suggests is that these mutations likely arise in, in people. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't find any of these human adaptive mutations in, in these birds. But our data set was also small. So, I mean, it's certainly possible that these viruses could be arising in these birds. Um, you know, another factor to consider is that we don't really understand what the transmission bottleneck size is between birds to humans. So when a person's infected, how many viral particles are founding those infections? You know, yeah. I, I don't really, I don't know. And that, and that matters for thinking about how these mutations are arising. I mean, the other issue is that it's thought that the virus has to get deep into the human respiratory tract because that's where the alpha 2-3 receptors are, at least to get started. And that's a pretty big, that's a pretty narrow bottleneck, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. I believe it's like usually smaller particles that are able to settle deeper into the airways. Um, But yeah, that's true. You know, so humans are often more infected with these viruses in in their lungs because they have, your lungs have more of the proper receptors that they can bind to. And are there any clues here about, I mean, you mentioned that the transmission chains are short if they exist at all, but any clues about the possibility of that um, shifting, that there's not just a spillover, but sustained transmission chains in humans? There's really no evidence of that. You know, I think um, the limited data that we have, you know, and we don't have tons of data on this, right? Because human Mm -hmm. infections are actually pretty rare. Um, But the limited data that we do have suggests that these viruses aren't adapting rapidly in these people. They're not quickly becoming um, human adapted viruses. Um, And we really don't have much evidence that uh, there have been past events where you've had kind of like stuttering chains of you know transmission but that doesn't mean of course that it that it couldn't happen or that it couldn't be possible in a different viral backbone that we haven't seen in you know in humans yet mm-hmm. and we just but say so these, far, the, good yeah i agree yeah fingers crossed of course and um you know here's to doing as few of these uncontrolled experiments as possible um uh, out in the wild um but so in these backbones you're describing and sort of that have the more of a possibility of moving to humans, does, do those, do the backbones, does that um, correlate with the clades of the, of the viruses or is there a different kind or, 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 or some of those backbones shared even between clades? Yeah. So I would say we don't actually have a great understanding of like which viral backbones are the highest risk. And so that's mm-hmm. something we're planning on doing in, in mm-hmm. future work in our lab. Mm-hmm. So we're going to be trying to identify these mutations that are correlated with past cross-species transmission events and see what phenotypes they elicit. So we're really excited about that. Um, in our preliminary look, um, there does seem to be a correlation with clade. Um, and if you look at these clades in the phylogenetic tree, they are pretty like phylogenetically distinct. So there will probably be, you know, some correlation here with clade, but the exact details there, I would say, are not worked out yet. Yeah, sounds like a great reason to open up a laboratory and continue totally. studying that. So, so, so will this be kind of, would you say this will be half of your lab's efforts or even more kind of in this, in the influenza space? Yeah, that's the plan. Um, so mm-hmm. I would say about, yeah, about half of our future research goals are kind of about finding these mutations uh, correlated with cross-species transmission and doing some of these other phylogenetic analyses. Um, another hope is to sort of, you know, maybe contribute to efforts on the ongoing H5N1 outbreak, you know, mm-hmm. so uh, mm-hmm. Penn Vet is actually like the primary testing site for birds that get infected in Pennsylvania. And so we're hoping to maybe, you know, contribute to our you know, local understanding of how these viruses are infecting and spilling over between birds in Pennsylvania. So yeah, about half the lab will be hopefully working on that in the near future. Sure. Very so we cool. had our we had our first U.S. Uh, human H5N1 infection recently, right in Colorado. <laughs> we did, yes, and this totally flew under the radar. Like nobody was talking about this, probably because there's you know way more exciting viruses transmitting <laughs> among humans, <laughs> much better right now. But yeah, it was really wild. So this person was um, an inmate who was on work release and was actually doing culling work in Colorado. Um, so uh, handling birds that were being culled to prevent oh. bird flu. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so wow. this person got infected. Yeah. yeah. So there's a whole series of things we could talk about there with like, you know, yeah. the risk of yeah. being an inmate. Yeah. But um, right. yeah, so luckily this person was treated with Othelthamavir. Um, mm. They had uh-huh. mild symptoms actually, and they didn't, there wasn't any onward transmission and they fully recovered. But Great. yeah. So we are actually going to have Emily Travanti from the Colorado uh, State Public Health uh, Division. She's been on TWIV before. She, you know, she described the first alpha uh, variant in the U.S. Uh, of co- SARS-CoV-2. Now she has the, the H5N1, so she's going to come on in a couple of weeks and talk about that. So that should oh, be, be a lot one. of fun. Th- that'll be over cool. on TWIV? That's going to be on TWIV, yeah, in a Fantastic. couple of weeks. Um, yeah. And I'm, we have an inside thing because uh, my associate Amy Rosenfeld is a friend mm-hmm. of Emily's husband. So <laughs> it's a <laughs> nice connection there. Yep. That's right. Yep. Um, so, so, Luis, I guess the other half of the uh, equation here probably relates to SARS-2 and coronaviruses. Um, that was also in your 
that's in your talk at ASV, you also kind of gave equal time to the work you've been doing on SARS too. Uh, maybe set that that part of your research interest or the growing part of your lab, set that up for us and tell us what you're doing there. Yeah, sure. So to better set that up, it's, so the project mm -hmm. that we're planning to do on SARS-CoV-2 actually builds off the MUMPS project that we did. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just give you guys a quick overview of that and what we found there. So basically, mumps is sort of interesting because it's been causing recurrent outbreaks in vaccinated populations since 2006. So mumps was really well controlled in the United States um, since the introduction of the 2 dose MMR vaccine in 1989. But since 2006, we've had these outbreaks primarily among college students who are highly vaccinated. But we had an outbreak in Washington State in 2016. Um, that was a little bit strange. Um, and so the reason that we think there's all these outbreaks among college students is that we now know that immunity to the mumps component of the MMR vaccine wanes over the course of like 13 to 30 years. Hmm. And so if you model this, um, young adults who were born in the 90s um, are now very susceptible to mumps. We mm -hmm. think because their vaccine induced immunity is waning and they never got any natural boosting because mumps was so well controlled during the 90s and early 2000s. So there was never any kind of natural circulation. So that's great. Um, but in 2016, Washington State and also weirdly Arkansas had these outbreaks where like over half of our cases came from this one ethnic community and our average age of infection was like much younger. So most of our cases were actually in children. So people we wouldn't expect to be susceptible due to waning immunity. So we did this collaboration with, with the Washington State Department of Health. We sequenced a bunch of genomes from Washington uh, where we knew the person's age, vaccination status, and whether they were part of this ethnic community. Um, and we also sequenced some viruses from other US states. Um, and so we did a bunch of phylogeographic work. And basically what we found was that our outbreak in Washington was likely seeded by multiple introductions from across the US. Our outbreak was highly connected to the outbreak in Arkansas. So we had multi, like four introductions from Arkansas that accounted for the vast majority of cases that we observed in our outbreak. Mm -hmm. When we looked at um, quantifying transmission in different groups, so we looked at age groups, vaccination groups, and ethnic groups, we found that transmission was just like overwhelmingly being um, sustained in this one particular community. Mm -hmm. So we got to the end of the study. It was sort of an uncomfortable conclusion. <laughs> we were like, how do we write this paper? What do we, what do, we do? Um, and so we ended up actually consulting and hiring on some community health advocates from this community. And so we conducted all of these uh, interviews with them to ask, like, how do we, you know, how should we write this paper? What are the health goals of the community? And why do we think, why do you think transmission was so intense? And like, tell us about what it is like being in your community. Do you remember the mumps outbreak? Stuff like that. And so um, this community, um, this ended up being super, super interesting and completely changed how I think about respiratory virus transmission. So this community is the Marshallese. So the Marshall Islands are a series of uh, islands in the South Pacific. The US actually occupied the Marshall Islands in the 1950s um, or after World War II until the 1980s. And from during that time period, actually used the Marshall Islands as the US's primary nuclear testing site. So they detonated all of these nuclear weapons as part of this testing program. The effects were really devastating. This like destroyed the environment. People were forcibly moved from these islands, um, but many individuals were um, exposed to nuclear fallout and uh, nuclear contamination still exists on these islands today. So as part of reparations for this testing, the US signed this treaty in 19, the 1980s called the Compact of Free Association, which stipulated that Marshallese individuals can live and work in the United States without visas. Um, however, they actually revoked access to Medicaid for Marshallese residents due to a clerical error in the 90s. Mm. Mm. And so this has left like the vast majority of Marshallese individuals residing in the US without um, access to affordable health care. Mm. So they're this very unique and small group in the US. So they're at this like legal resident population that is not exempt from having healthcare coverage under the ACA, but they are ineligible for Medicaid. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so when we kind of like wove all of this together, um, what we ended up concluding was that there were probably multiple factors that um, increased transmission risk within this community. Hmm. Um, you know, we think 
there's a lot of concern within the community about immune damage from radiation exposure. And this has not been studied at all. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of concern for this in the community and, you know, it should definitely be studied. But what also came through in our interviews was that like trust in US healthcare institutions and public health institutions was like absolutely decimated by this weapons testing. So that's absolutely a barrier to mm. seeking health care and working with public health very understandably. And so that probably kept the vaccination rate down, right? Well, no. So that's actually what's interesting about this group is that they're actually more vaccinated with <laughs> mumps vaccine than the overall population of Washington. So wow. we mm. actually don't think this is related to vaccination. Interesting. So there's concern that they're not responding to vaccination in the same way yeah. that um, other individuals are. Um, but it can also be, you know, a, a problem if, if people aren't, you know, able or, or willing to kind of like isolate. Um, so, you know, transmission can just yeah. be really high in these interconnected mm -hmm. networks. Um, we think household size may play a role. So household sizes are larger. So there could have just been more contacts among individuals. Interesting. Um, and then we think healthcare access is quite important too. So people like, aren't able to seek healthcare and that can really drive up transmission intensity. I see. Yeah, and this was this was published in eLife. Uh, uh, this story, correct? Yes, that is correct. No, yeah, I'm going to put the link in the chat here yeah. so people can go check it out. It's really cool. Yeah, good idea. And will, this will be. Are you going to continue these projects in your lab as well, or what's the direction of the of these studies? Yeah, sorry, that was a really long lead up. But basically, what <laughs> um, <laughs> what we found in this study was that like a person's social network can be the primary risk factor for respiratory virus infection and transmission, even when vaccines are available and widely used. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we think that this is really important when thinking about long-term SARS-CoV-2 transmission, because even though, you know, we have these really good vaccines, as we've seen with SARS-CoV-2, that com doesn't completely wipe out the disparities in disease risk that exist mm -hmm. across our society. And so um, one follow-up that we're gonna do is that we're planning this large phylogeographic study and so one of the things that we found in the study was that we had all these hypotheses from talking to this health advocate about factors that increase transmission risk, but we really couldn't tease them apart in the context of that study. But for SARS-CoV-2, we have tons of data and really good dense geographic sampling from some areas. So we're going to do this large collaborative study with um, collaborators across the Midwest. So we have some friends, so actually Adam Loring, um, mm -hmm. Tom, my former PI, uh, mm -hmm. and um, some collaborators at the University of Minnesota have already pretty good sampling across the US, I mean, across the Midwest, but we're mm -hmm. also going to prospectively try to increase the number of genomes we have from rural areas as well as underserved areas. So these are areas that haven't been sampled genomically very well. We're then going to look at how sources of viral transmission and diversity change over time over the course of the pandemic um, in these areas which, which have really distinct sociodemographic features, vaccination rates, and geographic settings. And so we're going to look kind of like at how this changes before vaccination, after vaccine rollout, and then as we move forward as new variants continue to emerge and evolve. Gotcha. And so, so this is all SARS-2 now. Um, and you're, well, but you've already... Good. Yeah, and you've already been working with SARS too. And so maybe let's talk about, this is um, also in your talk at ASV, but then this, um, another PLOS pathogens paper, acute, the title of this one, Acute SARS-2 CoV Infections Harbor Limited Within Host Diversity and Transmit Via Tight Transmission Bottlenecks. So maybe take us through that for a minute or two as well. Yeah. And, and Louise, in, in your ASV talk, you gave a nice, historical perspective, you know, starting from when the virus first came into the U.S. and the famous, you know, Trevor Bedford. <laughs> Do all that for us. I loved it. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the lead in here is that, um, you know, back in December of 2020, we had this, this sort of weird observation that made the rounds on this really niche virology blog server called Virological. And so this is a blog that people like evolutionary virologists post about kind of interesting biological things. And so what they posted on this blog was that they found this really strange group of viruses that just had like way too many mutations. And what I mean by that is if you plot the date that, you know, SARS-CoV-2 genomes are sampled versus the number of mutations in their genome, they tend to fall on this really nice um, linear line. 
what they found was that there were these viruses that just were like way off that linear line. So it just had like way more mutations than we would ever expect based on when those viruses were sampled. So these viruses were the B117s or the alpha variant. Um, and so these are really kind of the first variants of concern that we found. And of course, then those spread globally and this keeps happening and we just have keep new variants emerging all the time. So the emergence of these variants is really kind of thrown into question, you know, how do new mutations arise for SARS-CoV-2 and transmit and propagate and rise to fixation? Um, and so, you know, every novel mutation, be it a good one or a bad one, you know, has the same beginning. They all start as a polymerase error in an infected person. And so we wanted to do a study where we wanted to look at how novel mutations arise and propagate among individuals who are acutely infected with SARS-CoV-2. And part of the rationale for this was that there was this period of time um, when uh, we were doing this study where vaccines were getting rolled out. And there was some concern that immune escape variants or vaccine escape variants were going to rapidly arise within these infected vaccinated people and just select for vaccine escape variants so there was this open question of you know, how rapidly are new mutations going to emerge and be transmitted among acutely infected individuals so we did this whole study um, so we had samples from about 133 acutely infected individuals in wisconsin Nested within that data set, we also had the sub data set from individuals who were part of the same household. So, you know, they were likely infected via each other. And that gave us the opportunity to look at, you know, how many variants are being transmitted from person to person. So we did a bunch of different analyses, um, but basically what we found was that within host diversity in most acute infections is pretty low. So we found that your average infection has like five within host variants total. And this is a lot less than we've ever seen in influenza. So there's actually less diversity in your typical SARS-CoV-2 infection. We also found that um, the variants that arise during these acute infections don't really get propagated onward. So we did all these tests to try to see whether variants that emerged in people were ever found in downstream uh, tips in the phylogenetic tree or whether there was any signal for variants being shared across geographic spaces, phylogenetic divergence, um, or clade. And basically we found that like the only thing that predicted sharing within host variants was being in the same household. And even there, the effect was very modest. Hmm. So the last thing we did was quantify, um, we can use these models to quantify the number of viral particles that are being transmitted from person to person. And when we applied these models, we found that on average, a very small number of viruses are likely being transmitted from person to person between these household pairs. So anywhere from like two to 40 viruses. <laughs> and this is in line with what other people have found, which is that the bottleneck is probably very narrow. So our main conclusions here was that within host diversity is really low um, and that most diversity that's generated doesn't get propagated onward. And so that means that for any given um, acute infection, the likelihood of generating a new variant um, and transmitting it onward is, is a pretty low probability event. Yeah, that makes sense. Also a good thing, I guess, if that was a high probability event, it would be, who knows, the, the, we'd be kind of off to the evolutionary races here. Um, so yeah. how, I'm, I'm curious then, we've, so we, I think actually, Vincent, we looked at that, um, the graph that Luis showed at ASV and that you were just describing, we, We've looked at that on Twivo um, and yeah. kind of thought about that as some of these variants have emerged. We've also been talking a lot about the idea of, you know, some of the variants, but given maybe in part because it's these are such low probability events and such severe bottlenecks. The um, idea that, you know, immunocompromised hosts who are chronically infected could be mm. sort of the, uh, uh, enriched as a source for variants past, variants present, and potentially even variants future. What are, what are your thoughts about that, Louise? Yeah, I mean, there's all these hypotheses floating around about where mm -hmm. these weird variants are coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and what's so strange about them, right, is that they emerge on these really long branches from seemingly out of nowhere, where there's this all this evolution we haven't observed. Yeah. I think that by far, yeah, like I am definitely in the camp that I think the most likely out outcome is that these are coming from kind of prolonged infections where you have lots of time to accumulate these mutations. And, you know, there's a few papers that have, that have found this, right, that these mutations do arise yeah, and yeah. kind of fix in the in the confines of these longed infections mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah it's also it's so, really fascinating to hear just the um i mean the connections that you're weaving together here between the influenza 
cases, the mumps cases, and then now SARS-2. And it sounds like, um, you know, just given the um, sort of embarrassment of wealth of data in a sense of SARS-2 that, um, that, you know, this is really useful almost as a model system to think about, like to sort of push the modeling that you're doing or developing some of the analysis pipelines, but then using the, the insights that are only possible when you have sort of these data rich pipelines to then kind of use that back as other outbreaks are occurring, even with different viruses. It almost feels like an echo of the model systems era of molecular biology, where our sort of, um, you know, colleagues and predecessors picked or ended up working on a, a handful of model systems, yeast, flies, worms. And then this became useful for thinking about sort of principles of shared biology. Do you think there's a, a like a similar possibility here with SARS-2 as sort of a model system for genomic epidemiology moving forward? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting analogy, but I think you're totally spot on. I mean, I think we've never had so much genomic data before, you know, a lot of phylogenetics and genomic epi work is always focused on how do we, how do we get more data or how do we deal with not having enough data? And then suddenly we have this question of like, oh my gosh, how do we subsample data? <laughs> like, how do we deal with these huge files, you know, and how much data do we really need? Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I agree, like, basically we found these interesting questions in mumps and then decided to investigate with SARS-CoV-2 because that's where the high resolution data is. And I, I agree that I think the hope is that we'll find common strands, um, common information that can be like true across a variety of different respiratory pathogens. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, yeah, I mean, I think SARS-CoV-2 just with the wealth of data has already taught us a lot about how to, you know, update our computational pipelines and how to deal with data excess and all sorts of things that were hard to investigate before. Yeah, no, agree. I think, but it also highlights or underlines, like we shouldn't let go of what we can learn from these other, you know, smaller outbreaks in some of these cases, like that, the mm. mumps study that you're, that you did, that you were just describing and how that brings in a lot of these, you know, additional variables or maybe shared variables that are, are hard to tease apart. So in that case with the Marshall Islanders and their kind of complicated, um, history in the U.S. and um, as that relates to healthcare or lack of it or um, trust of the healthcare system, um, which will then matter for, you know, whatever emerging pandemic that we're um, up against in the years ahead. So it all kind of, I can, I mean, this is, I think one of the um, inspiring and unique in some sense things about the lab that you're launching at Penn is to kind of bring that, that broader vision together in new ways. And so really exciting. Um, could I yeah. could I ask? Um, um, so I, I remember you talking about this in your talk, but I don't recall that what, what you said. So for, first of all, if 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 the bottleneck is very small among people, um, then these variants of concern that we see must does that necessarily mean that they have some adaptation properties, human adaptation, or or evasion of immunity properties, or could it still be a, a very low frequency event that then is amplified uh, by passing through so many people? I, I don't know. I can't sort out which one, if any, is is the answer. Yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly possible that I mean, definitely variants like emerge via these kind of low probability events, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, like that certainly happens. But I think for most of the variants of concern we've seen, they do appear to have a replication advantage in, in some capacity in the population they're circulating in at that time. And so I think one of the dominant hypotheses is that, you know, in these immune compromised individuals with prolonged infections who are being treated with perhaps like monoclonal antibodies that you're then selecting for kind of immune escape variants that are then more fit at the, at the population level and that then they can kind of take over and sweep through and go to fixation. So, you know, yeah, I mean, but it, it is like a little tricky to figure out, um, but certainly yeah. having such a low probability event requires having lots of events. Sure. But for ever. influenza viruses, we, you know, every year we have more fit variants emerging, which are clearly immune evasive. And they, the idea is that they're selected by uh, antibody pressure, right? So there's no need to invoke a chronic infection, although maybe they just haven't thought about, it, you know, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So is that a difference in the two viruses, you think, or it's just something that hasn't been looked at for influenza virus? 
Well, so there is actually a little bit of data on this for influenza. So there's a really nice paper by uh, Catherine Chu and Jesse Bloom from a few years ago where they actually looked at evolution within these chronically infected individuals for flu. And what's interesting is they actually found something similar to what we're seeing with SARS, which is yeah. that you do see variants emerging within hosts and going to fixation that like later became, you know, dominant globally. So, um, so there, there are some parallels there and reasons to think that this is not an isolated phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I will also say that SARS-CoV-2 is doing something really strange that we've never seen for flu. And this is like why this is really hard and surprising. Um, you know, for flu, we have this really convenient uh, ladder-like structure where the new variants every year are emerging from the existing diversity that preceded it last year. Right. What was really <laughs> weird about SARS-CoV-2 is like Omicron emerged from variants that were circulating like in 2020, yeah. right? And so, you know, a ver Omicron didn't emerge from Delta. <laughs> and so I think that's what's so odd is we have these long branches yeah. with this unobserved transmission history, which we don't typically see for flu. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And so, you know, currently, maybe in the last couple months, um, it looks a little more flu like as Omicron just sort of steps along. But that's mm -hmm. maybe that's the million dollar question right now is, is there a new is the word that in the field a burst or is that my getting that right where it's just sort of shows up like the the way that maybe i'm making this up but the, that it just shows up sort of out of nowhere not out of nowhere it's still on the tree but it's in a totally different yeah. branch um which is what omicron did relative to delta it just kind of came out of nowhere and so i think that is one of the big questions is there you know a new greek letter um in the offing that's gonna come out of the and there's a little bit of you know a dust up maybe even a couple weeks ago with um the um, sort of rogue named Centurion or whatever it was, which is actually still within the Omicron lineage um, with maybe a combination of new mutations. Um, I don't know that that's um, picked up any steam in the ongoing sort of uh, Omicron sort of um, who's who's the variant sub variant mm. on the um, that's sweeping uh, the population at the moment. But that seems like the are, are there more of these sort of Omicron um, level events in the next in you know months years um that that could be coming down the road and i think my at least my take on the field i'm curious your opinion um both of you your opinions on that is like you know what is what's the probability of that happening or do we know what's coming next i mean yeah that's like the million dollar question right <laughs> and i think um yeah, I don't know. I mean, I hope these events become less frequent because they are really challenging to deal with. <laughs> um, I think, you know, with the diversification of Omicron, um, hope, you know, may, maybe that suggests that we're getting into this pattern where we're just going to see kind of iterations on Omicron diversity and more flu-like evolution. That would, I think, be easier to kind of deal with. Um, but could we have, you know, more weird events it's is certainly possible you know i think the best bet for reducing those is trying to reduce the total number of infections reducing mm -hmm. the probability of a long-term infection and then hopefully reducing transmission from those long-term infections that's a tough ask right because vaccines yeah. are <laughs> vaccines are not preventing an infection right so it's gonna it's like the common cold coronas right it's going to be infecting mm -hmm. all the time all year round and uh mm -hmm. i think that's really hard and that you know we have to learn how to protect vulnerable people from dying. Um, yeah. That's the real issue, yeah. I think. But uh, see, this is in, in part why I worry about changing the vaccine because we, we've used an ancestral vaccine and maybe we're we're going into the step-like evolution as Louise calls it. Or you say ladder or step. I think at ASV you said you preferred one. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, one of the, either way is fine, yeah. <laughs> and now maybe we're kind of to the flu scenario but now if we change the vaccine maybe we go back i mean that's why i'm a bit worried about an omicron yeah and somehow if you're using the ancestral you're wherever the it's the it'll come out of the base of the tree one way or another either as it's stepping along yeah. omicron yeah. or I mean, it'll come from somewhere that exists as part of this yeah yeah, yeah. maybe no, that's an interesting question so so louisa in your talk you you mentioned the fact that the the opportunistic sampling that was done uh in, in the Bedford lab early in the pandemic because you, you'd been doing a flu study, right? Were you there at the time? I guess so, right? I was, yes. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I didn't really work on this so much, but um, okay. yeah, you know, the, so the goals of the Seattle flu study were to characterize all flu infections in Seattle. 
Um, and it was just serendipitous, I think, that the flu study was kind of funded and off the ground when uh, the pandemic hit. And so there was this whole uh, series of things that happened where, you know, they were trying to also add testing for, you know, SARS-CoV-2, and then they found a positive. And there was this whole series of, you know, thorny ethical issues about how to report it and whether to report it, because at mm. the time it wasn't a CLIA validated assay. Um, so you know, I, I can't really speak to a lot more details on that because I wasn't really involved, but it was certainly an opportunistic finding with a whole set of issues. Well, we have to get both of your mentors, Trevor and Eddie, <laughs> on Tuivo, right? Yeah. Nels, uh, yeah, separately. Separately in that. <laughs> we'll do That's it. All. Um, Eddie is a little challenging now since he's all the way over in Australia. Although, as you pointed out, Vincent, we do have a, a live streamer with us from New Zealand, so yeah, um, we, we can Not we impossible. can do this. Yeah, or alternatively, Nels, you and I could go down there. I don't have a problem. Yeah, with that. I like I like the sound of that. Maybe that's Twevo One Hundred. We'll go uh, <laughs> hit the road for a big celebration. But no, it's a, I'm, you know it was really fun to hear you, um, Luis, describe how that class from Eddie when you were an undergrad was sort of inspirational. <laughs> He's uh, one of my science heroes too, and then obviously has played a, a big role in um, the early SARS two days and getting that the first sequences out, um, which have turned out to have sort of a pivotal part in the story of getting the um, vaccine up and running, um, which is another topic we heard about it at ASV, um, uh, sort of across the board. And so maybe actually I was hoping we could do an ASV roundup, but maybe before we get to that, Luis, is there any um, uh, sort of conclusions that you want to put on that or um, future directions in the SARS-2 space as you're, as the transition is underway here to opening your own lab in a month or so? Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing we're going to do is that large biodynamic study kind of looking at sources and sinks and geographic setting and vaccination status and sociodemographic factors. Um, but I think, of course, like a huge open question for the field is better characterizing you know, how evolution occurs in these long-term infections and whether the patterns of evolution we see in those long-term infections, um, you know, match what we see on these long branches on the tree. And so I think um, those are pretty exciting areas. And I think probably a lot of people are interested in looking at that, but definitely an important open area for the future. Yeah, agreed. So I have to say like the ASV meeting um, was uh, my first meeting back since uh, the pandemic occurred in 2020. Um, and so, you know, sort of, um, I don't know, pivotal for many reasons to, and to just return to sort of come out of hibernation scientifically a little bit. And re it really reminded me um, of, you know, why it's important for scientists actually to hang out together in vivo um, from time to time <laughs> and, and do these kind of things. And I thought the best talks really, were ones that sort of, you know, it, you listen to that and it wasn't just like, here are the details of what I was presenting, but here's like a way of thinking about something or an opportunity for, you know, kind of looking at data in a new way or getting, you know, sort of feeling like there's some growth, like the, the scientific process isn't like what we did, it's you're on to something new. And so the mm -hmm. talks that sort of um, could convey that are the ones that really sort of draw me. And so I think both Vincent and I would agree, Luis, that your talk falls into that category. Um, Thank you. Uh, and, um, but I'm kind of curious if the two of you had, saw other talks like that or what were, um, you know, were there other scientific encounters that were, that had that sort of energy to that? Um, yeah. I don't know. It's kind of a, yeah. kind of a big question. Go ahead, I, go ahead Louise. Yeah. I'll let you yeah. go first. Yeah. So, I mean, I was actually, I was really excited about Nicholas Wu's talk. I mean, obviously he's highly successful. He won, you know, the Young Investigator Award, but you know, he, I think he's just taking this like really innovative approach to looking at, um, you know, really basic mechanisms of how influenza viruses are evolving and the constraints on those evolution, but coming at it from these like biophysical approaches with these high throughput assays. I just thought that was really, really exciting. Um, yeah, I thought I there was this, some... is, this is Nicholas oh, Wu okay. at University of Illinois and mm -hmm. the, one of the Palmenberg Award winners. Yeah, that, I right. agree with you, Luis. That was a great one. Yep. Um, there were some really great talks by uh, like students and postdocs, and um, I mostly went to like the ortho mix of virus panels um, as well as the evolution one. Um, I feel really bad. I don't remember his name, but he was in, I believe, in East Lowen's lab. There was this really fun talk where they were doing 
they had done all this crazy sampling of pigs at this agricultural fair in collaboration with Andy Bowman. And they were looking at pig within host diversity mm -hmm. um, and transmission among these like pairs of pigs and finding like all this diversity that was transmitted between these, these pigs. And it was just like a totally wild story that I thought was really fun. Um, there were some really great orthomixo session talks on finding kind of new host factors that are important for influenza um, infection. And I just, I really love like well done basic virology research because I don't do that at all, but I just think it's so fun when people find like, you know, these cool host factors and can show mechanistically exactly what they're doing. So a lot of really great talks, I thought. Yeah, agreed. How about you, Vincent? I'm sure you spotted a few good ones. Well, in the evolution, the, what was it? The um, what was the name of that session? Now it's again. Oh, shaking, shaking, the shaking trees. the trees. <laughs> I really liked uh, Emma Hodcroft's talk. Right, that was beamed in in vitro to uh, yeah. contrast <laughs> to in right. vivo. Right, <laughs> but right. I thought it was really good. You know, I've been watching her from afar for the whole pandemic, and for, to hear her, uh, I, I need to need to get her on one of the pods also because absolutely. Uh, really eloquent and explaining why we need to do sequencing, right? And, you yeah. know, it's it's not necessarily about, you know, a health-related thing, but just understanding how evolution is occurring is because we, we have an amazing opportunity, right? Because yeah. we're doing a lot of sequencing and we're getting a lot of data and that just doesn't exist for a lot of other outbreaks. So I really enjoyed that one. But I also thought that a series of the morning talks were really paradigm-shifting mm -hmm. and – there was one on how uh, DNA viruses get DNA into the capsids, right? It's under yeah. huge pressure, and there are motors that push it in. And there was one talk, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but I think it's a guy who's moving to uh, maybe maybe Indiana um, from Texas. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that yeah, was sure. great. Blanking on the name too, but and yep. then there yeah, was yeah. another one on how the E7 protein, the transforming proteins of papillomaviruses, you know, it's a it's a P53 modulator. Mm -hmm. uh, these little viruses have to push cells into dividing because if they don't, there's no DNA synthesis apparatus available, and if something goes wrong and those proteins get integrated, then you have a transformation and maybe eventually a cancer. And yeah. so, you know, we've always said, e, you know, the E1A, the um, the T antigen, the E6, E7 of papillomas, they all antagonize RB and P53, and that's how you get the cells to divide. And he showed that there's, this is Carl Munger, he yep. showed that there's oh, a little yep. RNA involved in the protein binding to the other protein. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's so cool. I didn't even yeah. know that. Um, and there were a couple of others also in those morning that were really good in terms of changing the way uh, you, you look at uh, virology and I really like those a lot. Yeah, me too. Um, and I'm always on the lookout too for some of the host, uh, the virus host interactions. Um, one of the talks I wanted to mention briefly was uh, Melanie Ott. So she's at Gladstone at UCSF in San Francisco and looking at, so the nonsense mediated decay pathway is sort of this famous um, quality control for our RNA transcripts. If there's mutations, premature stop codons that get introduced during transcription. We've got this machinery that comes in and says, nope, we're not going to translate this protein that could actually, you know, be a, a problem for the, for the cell. And so because you're detecting sort of rogue transcripts, it's kind of a, an interesting potential connection with virology where the viruses are, you know, if you're a host cell, you could say all of the virus transcripts are rogue and you'd like to identify them and then deploy this machinery to um, to um, you know, intervene, sort of an anti mm. uh, a defense function, and so the, in the Ot Lab, they've been spending the last few years looking at that those interfaces and um, and, and de describing them at, now at the molecular level, who's interacting with who, and from different viruses that are interacting with the nonsense mediated decay machinery in different ways, and so this sort of um, gets my evolutionary radar. Um, mm -hmm. running is to think about, okay, then is there an impact if, at these interfaces for how um, the host and the virus might evolve in these genetic conflicts? And so, yeah, I mean, the ASV meeting is so fun because you go all the way from, I think, those morning sessions that you're describing, Vincent, um, sometimes from some of the big names who've been running labs for decades, yeah. but are, and are sort of advancing these new concepts all the way to the kind of... Um, community fair level, like specific virus topics where 
we see a lot of students sometimes in a lot of cases um, giving the first talk at an international meeting um, and sort of seeing that community support at that level and, and in, in a lot of cases just as interesting science emerging um, as well from from those talks and so that's really I think the magic of ASV is um, to, to make these connections in person sort of across the board and then in the, with evolution sort of running through all of this whether it was shaking the trees or some of the emerging viruses the the ecology um, that's increasingly coming into the into play as well and so um, I can't I have to before I stop I had two others um, <laughs> a quick just awards actually one was um, Kismekia Corbett who is the other Ann Palmenberg um, junior investigator and Kismekia is now running her lab at Harvard and with a big hand in the development of the SARS-2 vaccine that came out of uh, Moderna and the efforts sort of the collaboration at the NIH where she was for a postdoc. And then finally, um, a little closer to home here, um, a, a great service award, the Jacques Award, which went to Vincent Racchinello, um, past president of ASV, and also um, recognizing all of your work, Vincent, as a prolific science podcaster. So yeah, what a, what a great meeting. It was just really fun. To be back together, I think I think uh, ASV is unique because, as as Nell says, it has this this spans this gamut, but it makes it difficult because in the afternoon you have to pick from hundreds of, well, dozens of <laughs> concurrent talks, and you know people running around from room to room. One talk finishes, a bunch of people walk out, and new ones come in. It's hard, but if uh, if you're interested in virology, I mean these are on college campuses for the most part. The one in Madison is at a convention center. But um, uh, Tom, our moderator here, he registered and went to ASV because he's interested. And you can do the same uh, wherever if it's coming. Where's it going next year in Georgia, University of Georgia, right? So if you live in Athens, you could go. We're nearby. Yeah. And <laughs> so right. I, I think if you really love viruses, um, you could go. And then you could see uh, live TWIV. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Always exactly. cool. All right. Well, we should move to our picks of the week. Um, and uh, we've got a couple here. So um, I'll kick things off here. So, you know, it, it, we mentioned this on the last Quivo, which was we um, at the beginning of July, it was like a couple of days away from the first images being released from the new web telescope. And I'm guessing everyone, most folks here, um, it's hard to miss them. That This was splashed across the <laughs> news in these um, first five just sort of knockout images. Um, my pick of the week is sort of was related to this, but I think we've all seen the images. But so I found I was curious, like, what's Webb actually? You know, we saw those first images. What's the micro? What's the microscope? The telescope um, <laughs> doing today? And so, um, you know, with that curiosity, just did a couple of web searches, and I've got a link here to the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, they have kind of two. It's sort of a fork in the road. You can either go to the Webb Telescope for the public or the Webb Telescope for scientists. I figure. I'm a scientist. We're all scientists here in some sense. So um, if you look there and you can actually kind of go through the, um, the menu here and um, science under science execution, they actually have the observing schedule. Um, you can go through this and you can um, in real time see what the what the micro I keep saying microscope. Tell us you can I'm giving away my field here as um, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> not a astro sort of level thing here the other direction. But um, you can actually see um, what's going on in real time. And so you know which of the instruments are running, what where it's pointing. Are they doing um, spectroscopy to try to figure out what are you know the star or the planet, the exoplanet they're they're looking at? What are the composition of the elements there or you know, or is there going to be some new knockout image? And so it's, it looks to me like it's going 24 seven now. And what an exciting time for that field as I, I'm guessing, you know, we've just got sort of an appetizer for the, for the science ahead there. So that's my cool. pick of the week. Ch check out the science, the space telescope science Institute. How about you, Vincent? What's your pick of the week? Uh, before I do that, let me just bring uh, up Tom's. Uh, oh, yeah. So Tom is our moderator, and he went to ASV. He says, the ASV 22 experience exceeded my most optimistic experiences, and weather was good for bicycle commuting, early morning and midnight <laughs> hour. So, yeah, you see, Tom uh, is not really a civilian. I mean, he has a Ph.D., um, and um, but, uh, you know, he's he's uh, he, he viewed himself as a civilian, I guess, and he came to the yes. meeting, which I think more people might want to do. It's, it's not all that expensive. I mean, I think it's 700 bucks or something like that. But considering you get so many talks <laughs> and 
and you get the wonderful food of yeah, meetings, food right? Good. Yeah, it's, it was good. <laughs> and I have to say on the bike commuting, this is a great, um, having the meeting at Madison, which is the perfect sort of, you know, the lakes, the two lakes yeah. um, that are sandwiching the town of Madison, um, the perfect town to gr hop on a bike and get around that way. And then now with these electric e-bikes, I was kind of hopping on those from time to time and did a couple of laps of Lake Monona. That was cool. That was pretty great. How was it for you, Luis, being back on your um, sort mm -hmm. of uh, home campus, PhD campus? <laughs> was it must have been fun. It was great. Yeah. I mean, you know, Seattle's so hilly and Madison's so flat. It was like a total dream to just walk around. And, you know, Madison's so beautiful in the summer. So yeah. it was great to be on the lake and get to see old friends and be back. Yeah. All right, so my pick. Um, I was very fortunate to go to the third international symposium on infectious diseases of bats. I just got back yesterday, which was in Fort Collins, Colorado. And um, uh, it was just fabulous. A small meeting, 200 people, multidisciplinary, not just infectious diseases, mostly viruses, but some, you know, white nose fungus and some other things. Um, People who study bats in the wild, ecologists, uh, evolutionary biologists, systematicians, all mixed together because, you know, bats are quite interesting and, and they have uh, viruses in them, which, are, as you know, I think the WHO has designated 10 viruses, uh, virus groups as problematic for spillover. And the bats have at least three of them, right? The filoviruses, the coronaviruses, and the henipa viruses. So... Hmm. In that sense, they're interesting. But what you learned at this meeting is that they're in, bats are interesting in so many other ways, right? So they're 20% of mammals. They fly. They have interesting immune systems. I mean, someone – and now people are starting to uh, do challenge experiments. Tony Shounce has a colony at Colorado, uh, University of Colorado. He brought, brought me to see it. We went into the room, and these little Jamaican fruit bats are flying around. Man, so cool. Uh, and so you can study their immune systems. You can start to challenge them with viruses. Someone reported challenging – in Germany, actually, a group. Uh, mm. they, they captured some bats, I think, in Uganda. They flew them to Berlin, okay, which you can't do anymore because now the airlines don't want to do that. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, they have temp – they put temperature monitors in them so they could monitor them continuously, right? They implant something in the – uh, and you can see when they're on the plane, their temperature drops, <laughs> and then it goes right? back up yeah. when they're when they're back. In, so it's a stress, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah, yeah. And they challenged them with uh, Ebola virus. Nothing happened. They're yeah. fine. Yep. And is I mean, you challenge people, which you can't do, but they they will die, right? So stuff like that. That's why this is a cool meeting. I, I put the link. Oh, let me put the link in the. Um, yeah, put it in the notes. The so this was there. I was I wanted to join you at this one. Um, I couldn't quite pull off the back to back. Um, in person yeah. meetings um, with a toddler in the mix um, in, my, in my neighborhood here, but um, the LD lab was there. So we were in the, uh, you know, other category. We actually have a fun project, not with viruses or uh, fungi, but with bacteria that cause diarrheal disease. And so Michelle Colbertson, yeah. who is an MD PhD student from my group, has been working on this and taking an evolutionary view of bat diversity and what that means um, for diarrheal disease, both for these um, bugs that encode these um, enterotoxins, which actually cause a lot of the symptoms of things like traveler's diarrhea. And um, the bat the evolution of the receptor of this enterotoxin is just off the charts. And so Michelle has been following that. And I know she was excited, Vincent, when you stopped by her poster. Um, that was sort of a meeting highlight for her. Um, and I agree, the, like we're making the a big investment in bats. Um, the biology is fascinating, the community coming kind of coming together, maybe a, another echo of these model systems, but in sort of the um, future of science for thinking about a kind of a confluence of interesting biology, including evolution. So. Wow! Yeah. What a great so I, I yeah. in the in the uh, website that I posted, there's the program. You can see mm. who, the talks, and they're the abstracts from most of the talks, so you can get an idea of uh, what was there. I just found it a great community. It was an eye opener for me because I always I just think of them in terms of viruses, but there's much more, and um, so much biology uh, I learned. Right, um, and, and so I. And I realized that the, the public has kind of a skewed view of bats. Um, 
you know, people think that they're the source of uh, our problems. Well, the source of the problems are always ourselves, right? Humans have created the opportunities for spillovers because we push bats out of their habitats uh, and so forth. There was one study done by the CDC where they put radio transmitters on the bat on the back of the bats, or they implanted I forgot what, and then they can track them. And these, I think these were Marburg. Uh, sorry, these were bats, uh, Rosettus bats, and. Uganda that carry Marburg, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. So they live in a cave, and every night they fly to the same bloody tree <laughs> to get fruit, and then they go back. And people build houses next to these trees, right? That's the problem. So anyway, people have a bad view of viruses, and I think we need to fix it. So I yeah. decided to start a bat, a bat podcast, and I asked for some volunteers because I can, you know, I'm not a bat expert. And so I got a bunch of volunteers. And we're going to start it in the next couple of months, hopefully. And uh, the, the idea is to, to bring uh, more information to the world about these really amazing creatures. They're just gorgeous. And they range, yeah. you know, from micro bats, <laughs> a couple of yeah. centimeters, yeah. to bats with six foot wingspans. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah, yeah. And they carry their young under them. The mothers are flying around. Car <laughs> it's just the coolest thing. Amazing. Yeah. So this was a great meeting. Awesome. Uh, I'm with you and, yeah. and thrilled to hear about this new <laughs> budding podcast on bats. Count me as an early listener. I can't wait to see it. And did you mention that you also did a – you recorded a TWIV from the meeting? Oh, I didn't. Yeah, we did record it. In fact, before I started uh, this stream, I was editing it here, mm -hmm. and it's with – Brianne Barker was at the meeting, uh, and uh, she and I spoke with Raina Plowright, who is, I would guess, a uh, e disease ecologist, uh, right, who is interested in um, very much in bats and how the, the infection, the viruses basically interface with their, with their lives. And she has been at Bozeman at uh, Montana State for many years and now is moving to Cornell. Mm. Actually, uh, and then Vincent Munster, who's been many years at the uh, Rocky Mountain Laboratories uh, up in Hamilton, Montana, and has worked on NEPA and uh, Ebola viruses. So great perspective. So you you want to check that out? Yeah. Very cool. Well, I think that wraps it for today. Oh no, sorry. Actually, Luis, do you have a pick of the week? I didn't come prepared with the pick of the week, so, <laughs> so I'm not sure that I do. That's just fine. You're, we can, um, we'll, we'll get the link to your new lab website and make that the pick of the week. This is the launch of the Munkle Lab starting um, grand opening uh, September 1st, 2022. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Sounds good. All right. That'll do it for Tweeva. This is number 80 now. So we're, we're making our way to it towards 100. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, maybe for 100, we'll go to Australia and we'll stop in New Zealand on the way because Andrew no said we have to stop uh, in New Zealand on the way yeah. to do that. That sounds great. All right. Twiv Twivo number 80. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Twivo. Uh, if, if we will post when these um, live streams happen. We usually give you a few days notice. They're one a month more or less. But if you do have any questions in the meantime, you can send them to Twivo at microbe.tv. If you enjoy what we do here, trying to bring science and scientists to the, the public, uh, consider supporting our work. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Microbe TV is the parent production company for all the podcasts. It's a 501c3. So that means uh, your, your donations, at least in the U.S., are federal tax deductible. Our guest today, Louise Monkla, is at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center only for a few more days and then on to the University of Pennsylvania in the wonderful town of Philadelphia. Louise, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This was lots of fun. Nels Eldi is at cellvolution.org. L. Early Bird on Twitter. Good to see you again, Nels. Yeah, great to see you, Vincent. Sorry I missed you in Fort Collins, but I'm hoping for some more in vivo opportunities ahead. Well, they, um, they, they that meeting is every couple of years, but uh, yeah, if you're ever in New York, now stop at the incubator. We'll do something yeah, here. I know where you're located. Count me in. <laughs> <laughs> and Louise, if you're ever in New York, come by. This is our studio here, and uh, it's, it's two blocks from Penn Station, so you, you definitely have to stop by and visit. Perfect. 
In fact, that someone I met at the meeting, a scientist from uh, Berlin who who did that that Ebola challenge. She's visiting New York. She's stopping by in a couple hours. I said, "You have to come. We have this Ebola virus painting uh, on yeah. the wall of the incubator. You need to get your picture in front of it." So yeah. she's coming by. That's Very awesome. Cool. The incubator is like a good just landing spot for scientists. You can kind of come celebrate and kind of renew a little bit. It's sort of absolutely. It's a great- a great oasis for science. It's a, it's a destination. You know, I have a, this thing in my office at Columbia, the wall of polio, right? Mm-hmm. But um, I'm going to move it down here. So this will be the destination. People used to go to that and get their picture taken in front of the wall. <laughs> and now uh, here uh, it will be the incubator. So anyway, uh, th- th- that's uh, in New York City, of course. Uh, I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Uh, the music you hear on Twivo is by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. We've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, stay curious. <laughs>